Right, where are we? Okay, let's make a start. Good evening, everybody. Good evening and welcome to Gloucestershire in the UK for tonight's Arboricultural Association Wednesday webinar sponsored by Still. My name is John Parker and I'm CEO at the association. Please use the chat to say hello and let us know where you're watching from. I've got the chat flashing up already here. It's always very, very distracting. I was going to see who said hello first, but we'll scroll up to find that. Um, that's not important. I distract myself with these things. Uh, let us know where you're watching from. Use the Q&A button if you have any questions that you would like to submit. Um, our speakers tonight, very excitingly, Ara Anderson and Henrik German. I'm going to say, I've already apologised for butchering his name and that's the only time I need to say it who will be talking about tree selection for climate resilience we've got some great webinars lined up soon as well over the next few weeks next Wednesday December the 20th we'll be joined by Clive Mayhew who will be presenting Woodlands at War the impact and legacy of World War One and Two on Britain's woodlands and then on January the 3rd, in our first webinar of 2024, very excitingly, our guest speaker will be arboricultural legend David Lonsdale, who will be speaking about tree decay. And you can register free for those webinars and several others that we've arranged for your viewing pleasure via the website right now. So without further ado, it is my great pleasure to welcome our speakers for this evening. And first of all, I will hand over to Arit. Welcome. Over to you. Well, I should take myself off mute. I mean, most people can normally hear my dulcet tones, but not through the mute button. So that's that. So welcome, everybody. Um, nice to hear that there are people out there. We're not just talking to a screen. So I'm just going to uh, share my screen. Henrik and I are going to sort of bounce between. That's how we play tag team on these sorts of um, events. So I'll just sort of do a bit of an opening and, uh, and then I'll be handing over to Henrik. So just, well... Um, I would like to think that you've heard of this book by now. And if you haven't, you're going to get some insight into it um, across the evening. So um, we're really excited to be able to actually now have this book on the bookstores, um, in bookstores and available for people to be able to use and hopefully add um, into the information that they've already got. We know that there are a lot of talented people out there, a lot of experienced people out there um, who know a lot about trees, but um of course, we're all learning. What we are all learning is about um, how our um, environment is shifting and changing and how a lot of the plant material in particular is um, ad adapting to those changes. So um, I'm going to sort of open about how did this book start? Um, and I'm rolling right back. No, that's not me. That's my little nephew. He'll be horrified that he's on a screen. Um, but little Tony, bless him. But I want you just to look just past Tony on the right. And you can see a little, well, oak tree um, right in the back in the corner there. Where Tony is sitting, it was the house that I grew up in. And that green little um, expanse, not hugely big, but to a child, it was it seemed like obviously a, a massive expanse. But the tree was a big anchor. It was a tree that I was not allowed to go beyond. Um, it was a tree that all of us kids would meet and play uh, run outs from and be under its shade in the in the um, heat, especially the summer of 77. Yes, sadly, I am that old. Um, her first big heat wave that we all first remember. Um and it was really quite an anchor. And it's quite funny that um, as, as you know, working with Henrik um, on the book and um, with our publisher, that you realise that there's a lot of people that have a lot of anchor um, to trees. Of course, a lot of people in the audience that are, are here, your professionals, um, you might be just tree lovers, tree huggers, people that are already obviously um, connected to trees. But I think we have to always remember that there's a wider audience, the public, um, People that, are, that, that are trees are not in their world on a day to day basis. But I bet if you were to talk to a lot of people, they'd have this very big um, connection to trees. And I think that's what's really massively important to to think about. Certainly somebody who enjoys communicating. I like people to understand uh, why things are so important. And we saw a lot of that play out um, with the uh, felling of the sycamore gap tree. Now, this is one of many trees, I'm sure, that people were upset about. But just in the more more recent months, there was a real public um, cry. And I mean, I've not seen the sycamore gap and now I won't see it in this position um, again. But the fact that we are 
um, have, have a big connection to trees and place making um, and uh, emotively how charged that they can be. There, there as we know, there are the beings that are obviously giving us life, giving oxygen and all the other things um, that they can offer us as well. But I thought it was quite interesting how the public were really quite disturbed by this. Um, and yet we know that there are trees being felled around the world, left, right and centre um, in our rainforest, etc. But the point is, is that this sacrificial tree put trees back on the map, even if it was just for a short amount of time. It was very important. Now, some of you may or may not know that my uh, coming into this career of, of horticulture and garden design and landscape was a little bit later in my life. Um, so I've had other incarnations before that in terms of what I did. I'm not going to go through that today. But um, in a really, really short uh, roll forward, um, I after I finished doing garden design at, at college, um, I did a show garden that got televised at Hampton Court. And that propelled me very quickly into media. Um, which was great because it gave me a, a be able to have a voice on behalf of others. And the voice and the, and the um, subject that I've chosen to champion is about the environment and coming at it very much from the public perspective. How do I know? How do I know if I'm doing any good? So with the um, uh, ability to be through television media, publication media, and, and now the book that we're going to be talking to you about, you know, it's taken me to places. It's taken me to places like Milan and, you know, the Bosco Verticale, where I'm sure a lot of, you know, most of you will know about it. This kind of how are we going to use trees in a changing climate? There's there's different thought processes about whether, you know, uh, the Bosco and the vertical planting is what it should be about. But I, what I was really drawn to about this story was the fact that people were wanting to think about trees, literally um, uh, highly revered trees off the ground and how we should be up close and personal with them. So in terms of sort of then, well, how did the book come about? Well, I met um, a fabulous publisher, um, Anna Mumford of Philbert Press. We met, um, oh, sorry, just before I go into that, I'm sorry. Just leading on from the, the Bosco uh, story, the other thing that was driving up was this whole trees, 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 trees are going to save the planet. Um, all of the tree targets that I'm sure you're more aware of, whether it's in the UK or wherever it is around the world, the three trillion tree target. And I'm sure many of you are aware of the fact that the, the, the intention is great, but in terms of it saving the planet, we'd have to roll forward quite some number of years before we'd be able to see the impact of this um, tree planting. So I was quite intrigued um, by this momentum that was going on. And then I met uh, the publisher. This is obviously, uh, she's not hiding. She's just not <laughs> not visible there. But Anna Mumford, and uh, we met um, down in uh, lovely Hampshire and out in nature and having a walk. And she approached me about what would I like to write about in terms um, of a book? Because I hadn't written a book before. And it seemed to be so funny to have gone around so many different houses. But then all of a sudden it seemed very apparent that I wanted to write about trees and in a way quite selfishly, because not being somebody that was specifying huge amounts of trees on scale. But I felt that even the one or two or three that I might be putting into a garden how do I really know that I've chosen the right trees? Um, so many trees selection um, at a garden designer level, and I'm not being rude to those people that have more than just the height, spread and aesthetic, but I was with some garden designers, um, a, a group um, a, a couple of weeks ago, and they said, in fairness, in the main, those are the big drivers, especially when you're in garden settings. Obviously, out in wider parks, it can be quite different. But in garden settings, people want to constrain trees by what they look like and how big they get. So speaking with Anna, um, we, I, we sort of felt that there wasn't really a book out there that was talking about how trees um, would need to adapt or the choices, sorry, of what we would need to have with our changing climate what what books out there could really give that um there may be little splatterings through trees some of you guys might have books that you say do all of this at once but i certainly hadn't come across it so it sounded like a great idea and then of course you sit down and have another cup of tea and realize ah oh, i don't really know enough in fact i don't know nothing <laughs> in comparison to the information that i would need to have but at that point, I was having a little scare and I thought, but I do know somebody who knows a lot 
And I do know somebody who's got a really fantastic approach and energy um, that felt new and invigorating and um, exciting about trees. And I hadn't really heard somebody talk about that in such a way. So roll forward, rum roll, da-da, there he is, now my uh, buddy. I'll talk about that picture in a minute. Um, but following on from something that um, somebody said to me before, that collaboration is absolutely key. And I think that in this um you know, climate crisis, biodiversity crisis, well, you know, all of the doom and glooms that we've got. And there's a lot that we do know. There's a lot we don't know. But I feel like that, that because of the time scale that we're on, it's incredibly important to butt up to people who you know well. So um, I went and met Hemrick. Um, we'd met a couple of times at some talks. Um, I didn't ply him with too much alcohol, I don't think. Um, but I certainly, uh, yeah, don't give that head to me, Hemrick, though. I saw that. <laughs> Um, but we had a good chat. And the thing was, was that a lot of the work that I was, um, a lot of the questions that I had, Henrik had already done a huge body of work. So it just felt great that we would be able to team up and bring something to um, the, uh, the the party, if you like, that had a new uh, take on it. Um, the thing is about teaming up with people, make sure that you um, ask them what football team they support. Um, had I have known at the very beginning that me and, me and Henrik would be sat in a stadium with um, opposing football teams, it would have been, we probably wouldn't have written the book, I've got to be honest. I'm not going to talk about who he supports or who I support, um, but the next slide that um, Henrik is going to probably show you is, is can tell you what I think of the team that he supports. But, but anyway, that's the context of how the book comes about, is the fact that trees have been with us ever since we were little. Um, and then, of course, there's those of us who um, choose to have it as a career. Um, but I think it's a case that now um, where trees are so important, that's why the, the, the this book um, became important to us to help people um, to select trees for a changing climate. So I'm just going to stop my share and um, hand over to my dear colleague. I could get my mouse to work. All right, thank you, Arith. And um, I will disappear from uh, from the screen because I, I have to lean over the microphone over here. But that's um, that's how it is. It's my voice is better than my look. So there you go. And I hope you see something pink here. Yeah, and, that's perfect. Yeah, thank you. And yeah, and my name is Henrik Schoeman, which I know all the Brits have difficulties to pronounce, which is fine. No worry about that. And um, I was very pleased uh, to be invited to this book project by Arit uh, a few years ago. And my background is that I'm a landscape architect. I'm working with uh, plants since, yeah, many years ago. I started work with research. Like 20 years ago, I started doing research at the University of Agriculture Science. I also, the last eight years, work, working with um, uh, Gothenburg Botanic Garden, where I work as a scientific curator and also have a research position at Royal Botanic Garden Q, where I, together with colleagues there, do a lot of research about tree and trees. But for me, when it comes to tree and tree re research, I'm, I'm very applied. I always reach out to the industry to see what kind of question, what kind of um, yeah difficulties is out there that needs to be solved. And uh, one important thing is to create a communication, create a language, how to uh, argue why some trees are better than others and so on. So the last like 20 years, this is what I've been doing, trying to create this kind of language together with, of course, other researchers, where we try to develop some kind of guidance. Because I always come back to this um, when you compare uh, engineers designing computers or um, car engines where they can uh, talk about the different uh, parts in an engine or in um, in a computer, which different parts do what, what they to combine them, what's the capacity, how you can increase the capacity by using that one instead of that one and so on. And that kind of language I always also want to have when it comes to plant selection and garden design or urban planning or urban forestry. We, we need to have that kind of language 
in order to be taken a little bit serious. And uh, one very important uh, tool in this understanding is, of course, ecology. Because by understanding the living environment, the trees are planted into or trees have been developed in the natural habitat. By understanding how trees have developed different kind of straight traits and strategies in order to compete for resources, but also tolerating different kind of growing habitats, climates, and so on. That gives us a very good start to understand why this plant is better than other. And within ecology, there is different fields that are better than others when it comes to us, when uh, us, I mean, plant users. And that's functional ecology. Because within the field of ecology, functional ecology actually explain this why and how. And this why and how is important when it, when it comes to plant use, when it comes to selection of trees for urban environment, because we need to know why some trees are better than others. Why in the na natural habitats trees are better here, over there, to compete for resources compared to there. And also this why and how. How does that tree make it better for competing for resources over there and not there? Because if we can understand this why and how, it is possible for us to have like a language or argument why we shouldn't continue work with these kind of plants. Instead, we should work with that kind of species of plant groups. And in the book, when we planned this book, I was very um, eager to to include this in the book because we don't need another tree book that just have from Abius to Selkova explaining how high, how wide, if it's drought or heat tolerant, or if it um, what kind of seasonal qualities, what kind of flowers, autumn color. We have enough with these kind of books. Instead, we need to have a book that explain not only its drought tolerant how drought tolerant is and why and how does it make how does it do in order to be tolerant for drought or for heat or for flooding because if we can add that into a tree selection book i think we gain some new ground in a way so that that's the one of the biggest purpose with this book in a way so this uh, presentation i will have here is just one example of how this functional ecology is rich over to plant use for urban environment and it's just an, uh, one of many examples that we have included in the book. And uh, since we're not able to talk to each other, I will have this story just on my own. But I will start with a scenario. Think about this scenario. You have an agricultural field with this perfect soil, the best soil you can have, like a little bit clayish with a good water holding capacity, good um, uh, nutrients in the ground. And also, there is no shading trees around. It's just standing there. have unlimited access to resources below and above ground. So in this big field, you're planting one populus tremula, aspen tree, I think it is, aspen tree. And you're watering, you're weeding so that it doesn't have any competition, and you do everything to make it established successfully. And you do. You do it really good. In a similar field, you do exactly the same thing with a pine tree. This is Pinus sylvestris. And you're watering, make it established really, really well. And then you leave these two well-established plants for 10, 15 years. And then you come back. And then you realize the populus, the aspen tree, could be four or five times taller and bigger compared to the pine tree. And then you need to understand why is the aspen five times bigger than the pine tree. Both are pioneer species, both have the same condition, no, uh, no um, uh, competition for light or near, uh, resources below ground, because it's all about money. It's all about investment. We go back to the picture here. Because the aspen tree is a competitive species that are very successful in resource-rich habitats, in soil that are really 
uh, good in holding water and nutrients. And also in an early succession, you have more or less unlimited uh, sunlight above ground. By investing in really, really cheap stuff, like the aspen do, sheep leaves, the wood structure is really, really cheap. They have enough with resources to also invest in a fast growth below and above ground. Imagine if they have a capital, like a budget, uh, which is like, um, say, 100 pounds, which is in UK pounds, which is not worth that much today. Anyway, and um, if they have a budget of 100 pounds, if they spend 20 pounds of these cheap leaves and wood, they have 80 pounds left to invest in growth. By investing in growth below ground, they can reach better, more resources, water and nutrients, and also fast growth above ground makes it possible to reach better quality of sunlight, more leaves, more branches, could be have a more engine when it comes to uh, gathering uh, resources for the sunlight through the photosynthesis. But if you go over to the pine tree, which invests in expensive stuff, they also have 100 pounds of in the budget, but they maybe spend 80 pounds or 70 pounds on very expensive leaves and the wood structure, which means they don't have that much resources or budget left to invest in fast growth, which means the pine trees are slow, slow to establish, slow to grow. But... The last question is, which of these investment strategies between these two more or less extremes have best capacity to deal with a summer that UK had 2022, Sweden had 2018, a really, really warm and really, really dry summer? Of course, is the more expensive investment as the pine tree had. But that comes to a cost of slow establishment. So by understanding the priorities different species have in their investment tells you a lot when you're going to use them in urban environment. And there is a big field in within functional ecology about leaf economics, or even plant economics, wood economics, where you can actually evaluate the investment they do if they invest in cheap stuff or very expensive. Because these investments have consequences when it comes to where we can use them, how to use them, how to plan their establishment, and so on. And I would like to go a little bit further in this um, to by showing a model, which is very easy to understand. And uh, I will try to... to um, explain it really quick though, because I think you, you understand it. But this is an old um, figure where you actually um, put the species in this model depending on their strategy and thereby also their investments. So here you can see there is three corners in this model. You have the extreme C, S and R. C are competitive species like the aspen tree invest in cheap stuff in order to grow fast and thereby to be more competitive, to grow away from other species. In the other corner down to the left there, you see S strategies, this stress strategies. These are species that have specialized to grow and compete in resource limited habitats like shady, cool, dry, hot, and lack of nutrients and so on, that kind of habitat, they have been um, specialized. And then you have R, rural, which are uh, disturbance specialists. When you have a forest fire, you have a storm, that's other species that are the quickest to take this advantage of a disturbance. But I thought we'd go through this um, and give some examples. So competitive species are mainly found, of course, in rich and humid vegetation system, which means resource-rich habitats, and mainly early in the succession. So they have more or less unlimited resources both below and above ground. And they are also very skilled to obtain this available energy 
and create an advantage through rapid growth. And this is an example of some species, a lot of bird species, birch, betula, this is a betula utilis, of course populus, and also silver maple, Aces of carinum, and this is how it grows in New upstate New York. And the other extreme, as I said, the stress strategy, they are specialized to tolerance for one or a combination of resource-limited habitats. And these species you find on the more extreme sites in nature. For example, this, which is a natural roof garden close to Stockholm. It's not much soil to grow here. And here we can't find many broadleaf trees. Here we see the pine trees. But if you go elsewhere, elsewhere in the world, this is um, uh, the Mediterranean oak forest in uh, Western California. We have a lot of evergreen oak trees here. These are specialists to take the pain of drought. This picture is taken after three years of drought. And actually, there were five years in total before the rain came. And these trees just stand there and took the pain because they're specialized. They invest in really, really expensive equipment in order to deal with this kind of environment. So through evolution, they have developed this tolerance. And this is important to know for us where to use them. For example, in roof gardens like this in, in Gothenburg, Sweden here. And then we have rural. And among the rural, we doesn't find any long-lived organism. Because if you have a natural habitat which experience often disturbance, there is no wooded plants. Maybe sh some shrubs, but mainly herbaceous plants. And this is, of course, when you have this succession, early succession, early stage, but also when the succession comes all uh, in, in uh, quite often intervals. Because trees are long-lived organisms, they can't take a disturbance that comes every four, five years, because then, yeah, they can't deal with that. So therefore, most of the rural are annual or biannual or some really uh, disturbed strategists like uh, here. This is a meadow in uh, Romania, uh, which had been plowed uh, two years ago, and this is just filled with this... Um, um, yeah, pioneer species of herbaceous planting. So, by understanding which strategies plants is um, connected to, gives us a very good idea where and how to use them. But you can also take it backwards a little bit to see the project I'm working with, what kind of strategy is useful for my project. For example, if you have a new housing area or you have a playground where in both cases you need to have fast growing trees that create a canopy cover really, really quick. Which trees should I go for? I should go for the competitors because they can grow fast and create this canopy cover for wind or for sunlight really, really fast. But in order to get this speed in growth, I need to give them a lot of resources, which means a good planting bed with good resources, both below and above ground. So I hope you understand the way of thinking here, because strategies, we need that, and then it has consequences. The opposite then, well, in many urban situations, for example, paved sites, and the roof gardens or even old parks where you want to establish something below an already existing uh, tree canopy. All these, play, all these sites represent resource-limited habitats. And for these resource-limited habitats, we need to use the specialists. The specialists that through evolution develop and invest in, in traits and in strategies to deal with these kind of habitats. But then we have a lot of trees in between that have a rather high level of stress tolerance, but also rather good speed in their investments of growth. 
And this site could be, for example, you see the picture top left, structural soil. It's not the same as a garden and park environment, but still, there's a lot of space for the tree roots to go out. So it's pretty good, but not so good. Or in traffic environments, for example, the roundabout you can see in, in the below left. It's um, okay with space for tree roots, cave space, above ground, but this roundabout, the road around will be salted, especially in Sweden, but also in North America, you salt a lot in order to de deal with ice and snow and so on, which means that you get a lot of salt into the planting bed with the tree flow. Therefore, it's, there, is a limit, uh, there is a specific level of stress, but it's not that super extreme, but still there is stress. So therefore, this in-between feature could be interesting. This is a way of thinking to try to understand what kind of strategy. Instead of going on species directly, you can actually start to talk about which kind of strategists we need to have for that particular project I'm working with. And this is a thing I use a lot for in my teaching for the landscape architect and engineer students at the university. Because we can't generalize, like, oh, well, all trees in our organization is watering two or three years. It's not working because we need to be species specific. Because if we try to plant, even in this good, as a picture shows, really good park environment, park environment, we try to establish a stress tolerator, even if the condition is really, really good the stress strategy will be slow anyhow because it has learned through evolution to be careful, not over-invest in growth. Instead, invest in strategies like good wood, good leaf structure in order to be ready for tough condition. Which means that if we work in with stress tolerators, well, maybe we need to expand four or five years of establishment maintenance, watering, taking care of a tree. But if you work in park environment using, for example, a civil maple, which is like a hardcore uh, comp um, uh, competitive species, well, then you might have only two years of establishment maintenance. So by knowing which kind of strategies, what kind of investments, priorities the species have, gives you a good idea of how we should treat that for establishment. We need to be species specific when it comes to designing the establishment of the trees. And another aspect is also what kind of tree should we buy in from the nursery? Well, for species, competitive species that invest in growth, real offensive. Well, if you buy a bold and burlap tree or a um, what you call this um, uh, bare root tree. Well, when you dig them up from the nursery, a lot of the fine roots will have been digged away. So they've lost a lot of the fine roots. But if you have a personality as a tree to invest in new growth all the time, well, you will be fine. You will invest in new growth. But for stress tolerators that lose all of the fine root system, that could be a very stressful treatment, and which makes the establishment more risky and maybe a little bit more prolonged. So maybe for the stress strategies, we might use container growth trees, as we see in below right here. That's also a way. So you also have to be species specific when it comes to what kind of trees or the quality of trees from the nursery we should buy in, because. A tree, a stress strategy is that have all the root system with them, all the fine root system, everything will, of course, be easier to establish compared to a bald and burla. So, to summarize this, C strategies, competitors, they have a large and rapid change as a reaction of stress. A good picture is this one. Look at this. Oh, wait, we go back a little bit. Stress strategies. They have a slow reaction because they could can be slow because they have invest in a protection in the leaf structure, in the wood structure. A good picture is this one. This is from uh, the drought 2018 in Sweden. This is on a site which uh, very thin soil layer, 
this on a bare rock more or less. And here you can see the fast reaction to drought as a, as a competitive strategy, which represents here in the picture of the birch trees. They go quickly, like, oh my god, I'm dying, throwing the leaves in order to limit the, the, the amount of leaf area so they don't lose too much water. It's not, they're not dying, but they just react really quick. But in the middle of the picture, you see a Cecil Oak, Quercus Petraea, which is a stress strategy. Still green. Still experiencing the same amount of drought stress as the birch, but the reaction is slow because they have investment, invest in leaf and wood structure that gives them time. And hopefully that gives them enough with time. So this drought period is over and the rain comes back and they can just continue while the birch like naked, a little bit shame, have to wait to next spring. So by understanding the different strategy gives you a good idea of where to use them, how to use them. So, of course, there have been a lot of work trying to classify different species in this CSR uh, model, but mainly it has been towards herbaceous plants, not the woody plant. But me, together with um, Harry Watkins at um, St. Andrew's Botanic Garden and Anne Lyrons at Myersville College, we did uh, a job a few years ago where we tried to classify as many trees and shrubs we could find in our uh, our university arboretum here in Sweden. And we could create in this. It's over, I think it's uh, 400 different species and cultivars of trees and shrubs. And here you can see that the stress tolerator and the competitors you can see that most of the species are connected to that direction. You don't find any wooded plants in the rural corner of the model, as I said before. Long-lived organisms can't take an often occurring uh, disturbance. But it's interesting to see here, you have a gradient from competitors all the way down to stress tolerators. In the yellow corner, you can see the pure specialists. So I thought, in the end, just go through this a little bit. So we start with the competitors. And here, of course, we have a lot of popular species. The pictures below to the left there is from the steppe forest or the steppe environments of Romania, where you can see the um, populous nigra there, standing there like, I don't really like the heat here. So you can see that definitely throwing the leaves. But also you see the silver maple, Aces of Carno, uh, wing knot. I think I'm, I'm sorry about the English names of trees, sorry about that. But the wing knot, I think it is, Pterocaria, both Praxinifolia from Caucasus, but also Pterocaria insignis from China. But if you look at them, how they grow in the wild, they grow always close to water. So they're quick to establish and they're using the water in order to uh, spread the seeds because the seeds as a helicopter down to the uh, water go with the water flow and get stuck on the side of the water where they grow into a new tree. So they don't know how it is to live without access to water. They have no defense whatsoever for that. And the same is for many magnolia species. This is the big leaf magnolia bobata, but also the rest of the magnolias in this data set ends up in this corner. They are easy to establish, they're fast growing, and don't think about Defense for stress, they just go for it. Fast, but stupid. And here's some other example, Juglan cinerea, Tuna sinensis, and uh, Aesop said the Platanus, which is the sycamore uh, maple, which also is easy to establish, fast growing, but sensitive for drought. Tulip tree, yellow wood. And now we're moving down to the trees in between here. And now we're seeing trees that are not that fast to establish, rather slow to grow. One good example is the Turkish tree hazel, Curlus columna. This is from um, uh, Stockholm where they grow in, yeah, it, it looks terrifying to grow there, but underneath the whole um, sidewalk is actually a planting bed with structured soil. But these are famous to be slow to establish. But it may make sense if you think about it, because they invest in a little bit more expensive stuff than the competitors. 
and therefore the little bit slower. That goes also with Prunus agentii, which is among the flowering cherries, one of the more drought tolerant. This is the autumn colors. And then you also have the liquid Dunbar Sturacifla, which uh, could take some drought, but really good in warm summer climate to take uh, flooding, periods of flooding. And some native plants to us in Sweden. We have Acer Campestre, Sorbus Intermedia, which we know have a rather high tolerance for uh, dry, uh, drought and heat. And among the lime trees or linden trees, Tilia tomentosa is one of the most drought tolerant and also one of the more uh, heat tolerant among the, um, the lime trees, especially that we can grow here in Sweden and in, uh, in northern UK. But it's also famous to be slower to establish, have a little bit slower growth as a young tree compared to the other species that we use in. And it makes sense if you think about it because I can't be tolerating stress and be fast at the same time. They are, of course, some of the uh, trees that do that, but silver lime is one of those that take a little bit of time for it. Also, Sochense, which is a hybrid between Acer campestre and Acer cappadocico, beautiful tree, normally um, have this multi stem tree, Metzocoia glyptoscroboides. And now we're moving down to the specialists the stress tolerators. And here, of course, we've got this. This is the Hungarian oak, Quercus frainetto, growing in the steppe forest of east, southeast Europe. If you feel, if you feel the leaves, they are thick, they are like cardboard. And the Langus angustifolia, uh, the picture below is from Central Asia, uh, where they grow naturally on the steps. So if you're going to grow on the step, you need to be tolerant, you need to to invest in stuff that makes you surviving out there. So therefore, they are very useful for one of the more toughest urban conditions. For example, the picture to the left is in uh, central Malmö, in southern Sweden, where they can be very successfully growing in paid sites and still look marvelous. The picture on the right is at uh, uh, Uppsala Botanical Garden in, yeah, in Uppsala. And Selkova serrata, Acer tartaricum, one of my favorites, uh, maples actually. Not, I know, um, when I worked at Cornell University a few years ago, the professor Nina Bassett said, shit on a stick when she talked about Acer tartaricum. But, um, I don't know. I don't, um, agree with her because Acer tartaricum is one of the maples that can take drought most. It grows in the steppe forest of Southeast uh, Europe and it can take heat and drought as no one else um, when it comes to the maple there. And cornice moss, of course, grows everything from the steppe forest or even on the steppe in the forest edge to the darkest beech forest of Eastern Europe in Caucasus. So you can have enormous amount of different stress um, if you can take. But if you look at it, it's one of the slowest established, really, really slow to grow. And that gives, uh, this is, that's the same with Ringa reticulata, which is really slow, but it makes sense because it invests in different, different things. And the same with Coloteria paniculata. Carpinus orientalis, Rhododendron catabianse, of course, with, because it's very shade tolerant. Notophagus antarctica. And now we're coming down to the yellow corner here, where all the conifers exist because investing in these needles are very, very expensive, but it could be worth it because they're going to pay off in many, many years. So many two and three needle pines ends up in this corner like this, uh, Pinus nigra, and um, this is Pinus leopodermis, top right, Pinus sylvestris. So when you come back to the story I had in the beginning when we discussed why Pinus sylvestris is so slow compared to the aspen tree. Well, it makes sense. It expensive investment that will pay off in a very stressful environment. And then you have uh, hemlock, which is not drought tolerant, but a very, very shade tolerant. Do get to fill in this case. And also a lot of uh, fir trees. This is Arbia, Arbia somolepis from Japan. Uh, Abus prosera from western US, Abus normaniana uh, from uh, Caucasus, and the winner is Taxus 
Vakata. This is Taxi Vakata. I think it's a three days, two, two thousand, uh, two, two thousand to two thousand five hundred year old tree in Caucasus. So, I hope you understood this story because when we choosing plants, we need to understand where to use them and why they are suitable for that particular site. But also, you need to be aware of what kind of consequences it will make to use that species. So if you work in, in a stressful street environment, well, of course you go for the stress tornado. But that comes with consequences that are slow to establish, slow to grow. Maybe I should buy um, a bigger quality of tree. Maybe I should also work with container grow trees. This is the way we need to think and talk about trees and tree selection, because the selection we do will have consequences, and we need to be aware of the consequences. The consequence doesn't need to be negative, but we need to be aware of them. All right, over to Ari then. Thank you, Henrik. It's so weird seeing just thumbs going up or laughing at your lovely thumbs up. I should call it a thumbs up picture, <laughs> Henrik. Um, but um, no, thank you for that. And I hope everybody uh, was able to enjoy uh, some of those tree species and, uh, and, and what you were talking about there. So just to sort of uh, wrap up, really, um, of course, we roll back to the book um, just to kind of whip through very quickly how the book was uh, we approached the book in terms of its sections and just to say obviously you know coming on to um <laughs> this type of uh, webinar and the audience that's here of course a lot of things you know already we, we we know that that's the whole point we we know that there are a lot of people that do know things but my thing is always don't assume that everybody knows everything because I was quite um it was quite interesting like I said to be with certain professional groups who there was sort of quite a lot of stuff they didn't know. That's why, like I said, I, I came at this from the um, premise of what I didn't know. So, and also as well, if you do know things, the important thing is to obviously be communicating them, which is what we hope this book does. So, um, it's in four kind of key sections: um, hidden benefits of um, trees, which um, obviously, aka sorry, aka uh, ecosystem services. And I think also as well, it's important to um, think about the fact that. Um, Again, professionally, people may use this terminology, but more out in the public domain, it's not known. And I really uh, come from the premise that it's, it, there's no point in just having one language in one box and nobody else understands your language elsewhere. For it all to work, we all need to kind of start talking a similar sort of language so that people can make the right choices. So um, so there is um, elements around that. It goes into more detail about the four key areas of regulating, support and cultural provisioning, um, the detail in there, um, and uh, just touching on about you know, design principles, therefore, in regarding uh, ecosystem services. Um, think like a tree. Uh, uh, I hope that what uh, Henrik just gave you an insight there is very much about understanding how trees work. Of course, again, there's a lot of people in this audience that, that may know how they work. But again, we're trying to make sure that we're really uh, being able to bring the detail um, and, the, and sorry, the examples as well um, to people um, in terms of succession. Obviously, people think of yeah woodlands if you're speaking to certainly members of the public and if you're trying to work with um, the public in terms of being able to uh, plant more trees, getting them to understand that they are part of the urban forest, they're part of a wider canopy, it's not just the tree in their three boundaries. Yeah, this gives um, hopefully more people a, a way of showing succession and that trees aren't just for Christmas as well. We know that there's a longevity to that that shifts and changes. Um, deep going, whether it's drought tolerance strategies, whether it's flood tolerance strategies, and, and there's much more in this section. But again, you've just been given an example of it um, by uh, Henrik. 
Of course there's an A to Z. It would be rude not to put an A to Z in. And, of course, we have to go from A, B to Zelkova. That's just what it's about. But uh, we hope that within there there is a little bit more detail over and above just the height and spread, um, giving some uh, indication to people in terms of uh, some of the uh, more environmental uh, strategies or benefits that these trees can and bring. And, and I think, as Henrik's been talking about a lot, really uh, trying to be more detailed in a species specific way rather than just saying ABs or just saying um, Zelkova or just ACEs, you know, trying to kind of give a little bit more um, uh, flesh around that. And then um, this tree selection at the end, um, again, probably people have worked with TDAG, um, which Henrik obviously was a huge uh, contributor, contributor on as well. But being able to go to the back of the book, which people want to be able to do, um, go through, you've got your tree species, and very quickly be able to have a look and see whether it's good at drought, you know, wind regulation, has it got shade tolerance, salt tolerance, etc. So not every every final exacting uh, uh, piece on there, but again, a quick lookup table. And the idea that we really wanted to have um, with this book is that people will be able to have post-it notes, be flicking forward and back to it and really having it as a, as a working book as I'm sure most people do with their books anyway but something that is enriching um, information and just touching on uh, the one of Henrik's key passions and, and you know it'll be interesting when we have some time to hear from you guys shortly it is about language and having different languages to be able to talk about um, trees and being able to um, uh, to, to, to be able to talk into other um, organisations, other uh, groups of people as to why trees are being selected. Certainly myself as a garden designer, you know, I, I will have a client that just wants to have a tree that looks good, come to the nursery, I like the look of that one, and not want to have any further discussion around that. And so, of course, the more I can enrich my language about the reasons as to why that tree wouldn't be um, particularly good for that area or why a certain tree would, but using a lot more a lot, a lot wider language about the capacity of the tree performing if people really want to be able to um, help with the environmental issues. And I think a lot of people do want to help, but they don't know how. And, and trees are one way of being able to um, add into um, uh, the helping. Um, and then just finally, you know, we were very uh, lucky, proud, uh fortuitous, whatever word you want to use, to be able to have a, a lunch um, with um, Al Gore. Um, and he has had a copy of the book. He was very complimentary about it in terms of trying to push things forward, really. Um, and that was great uh, to be able to spend some time um, with him. But the key reason about that slide being up, it's not about us showing off that we met Al Gore. For me, um, one of the things, um, having met um, him um, on a couple of occasions is about communication. He is an advocate, obviously, of, of, of change. And, and it says to somebody like me, obviously, I'm not the tree scientist. Of course, I'm not. But I am hopefully somebody that is passionate about communication um, and use that ability. And, and, and Al gave the, the same sort of analogy to me. He's not a, a, a climate scientist, but he knows he knows enough of them to be able to keep um, communicating to people and getting the word out there. So if you are somebody that's sitting on a bank of knowledge, but you don't have, you're not being able to share it, or you don't feel confident to share it, or or any anything that's stopping you from getting that information out there, then find a friend who'll do it on your behalf, really, or buddy up with people, because that's the tipping point now of whether we can make um, an impact of change is, um, is, is on communication. And I'm very, very passionate about that. So I might not know every single species of Silcova, but I know Amanda does. Thank you very much. I might have to stop my share again. My, my little mouse has gone crazy. I found the button that does it. Oh, excellent. That's a winner. <laughs> Uh, brilliant. Thank you both so much. That was really, really interesting stuff. Uh, lots of excitement in the chat, which is great, and lots of questions. Um, so one of you might want to put a link to the book, uh, where you can get the book in the chat, because a few people are asking where you can get it from. Um, so uh, we can make sure that you, that, that is available for everybody. I'm sure we can get that into the chat. Um, 
Right, we've got lots of questions, some of them quite broad and some of them very specific. Um, here's here's a, a question that I think is often asked. It's one from Catherine. Um, Catherine's saying, in Yorkshire and probably other regions of the UK, it seems we now need to identify species that can survive hot, dry drought conditions with temperatures up to 40 degrees in the summer, but very wet, waterlogged, cold soils in the winter and waterlogged soils at other times of year. Any ideas? I mean, this is a real problem we've got, isn't it, with, with climate change, is trying to find something that can deal with kind of with everything, really. Yeah. Yeah, there is some... Um, I'm leaning over, I'm disappearing from the screen here. But yeah, th there is natural woodlands or natural habitats where you have that kind of environment. For example, if you go to the Balkans or southern uh, uh, or east, southeast uh, to, uh, Italy, there is a specific um, uh, forest type where you have thin soil layers, maybe just 60 centimeters thick soil layer, and be below that is just bare rock. So when it's rain, this shallow soil becomes very wet. And then a few days later, it dries up and becomes very, very dry very quick. So there, there is some ecosystem that have that. And uh, some of the species that we show here, for example, the Linus angustifolia can take that. And there is one Italian older, uh, Alnus uh, cordata, which is brilliant to take this fluctuation between really dry, wet, really dry, wet, and so forward. So try to understand that from this, uh, this kind of uh, woodlands where you can find species that match this kind of environment. So, yeah. Thank you very much. Um, Arit, what are you planting in your designs at the moment? Landscape architects often get, landscape designers get a bad press for sort of multi-stem, betula jack monte eyes and, uh, and all that sort of thing. What sort of diversity are you bringing to the gardens and you're planting now? Well, I mean, yeah, we were talking about this the other day. I mean, at the minute, I'm not uh, not working on uh, – I haven't got any projects at this particular moment. They're doing huge tree plantings. But that conversation was had with some um, garden designers the other day because it's either the, 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 the Betula or it's Amelanchia um, as a multi-stem. And, again, I think that a lot of that is driven out of the height spread and aestheticism. So, again, hopefully with this book – it's to give people more confidence to come away from what they know because that kind of tends to be the classic thing is I'll just stick with what I know works well where we're hopefully going to be challenging people that people ask me what's your favorite tree and now I'm like I'm not having a favorite tree I can't possibly have a favorite tree I need to know the situation that the, the, the of the space I need to know what I'm trying to do for the future what what the but going through this process and of um, you know getting the book out there with Henry, I mean, what it has done for me, I guess, is um, as a, from a design perspective, is to get, get a better um, relationship with time. Okay, I think that there's we've been in a huge trajectory of now, 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 plant it now, either plant really, really big because that just gives us the instantness from there, um, as opposed to really thinking about the, the true succession of what needs to happen. So that is definitely something that I will be taken into consideration more. Henrik was at my, in my garden the other day, I've got a eucalyptus mahusive that I uh, uh, um, inherited. Um, if anybody wants to give me a discount on reducing it, I'd be very happy for that. Um, but it is most massive. Um, and, you know, rightly or wrongly, I didn't take it out. Again, we had the conversation around, well, you need to start thinking about what you're getting in next, Arik, because that tree is not going to be able to stay because it's too close to the house, etc. So those sorts of things might seem obvious, but they're not obvious. And I think that's my key message from today. Don't just assume that everybody knows everything because they really don't. And that's why this book's there to help people um, get a wider breadth of why they are choosing trees and what trees to choose. Thank you. And of course, if you need your eucalyptus looked at, uh, an Arboricultural Association approved contractor is uh, what you should be looking for. And I'm sure we can uh, hook you up with one of those. <laughs> That'd be good. Um, right. Uh, now, a uh, question mainly aimed at Henrik, this one. Uh, Jim has asked if your research work is available to study in greater depth other than within the book. Now, I know the answer to that is yes, but I was wondering if just quite sort of briefly, could you maybe summarise some of the great work you've done over the years 
uh, looking at what species might be good for the future and how you've gone about doing that? Oh, uh, I'm, I'm very proud of... The thing is, in the book, we refer to research and we try to have as many citation in the book as possible so the reader can actually move forward to not only have the book as the, the only source, you can actually go into depth. So a lot of the research I've done is actually referred in the book. But one of the things I'm most proud of is that we have... Um, we, if you look at a uh, little bit older uh, dendrology literature, there is mainly men that state drought tolerant or drought sensitive. And if you look at the same species between different sources, they discuss that this is drought tolerant, no, this is sensitive. And the reason that there is no consensus in the information or in the, uh, the, um, in the guidance is that much of the knowledge is based on few people, authors, own experience or observation, rather than solid evaluation of the tree's uh, tolerance, for example. So what we did like 10 years ago, we started to see how can we screen, so not, not only say it's drought tolerant sensitive, we can also say how drought tolerant or sensitive. So we have actually screened a lot of species for the turgulose point, which is the cell structure in the leaves, the capacity to just stay there, tolerate, take the pain, and thereby buying the plants itself time until a rainy, cool weather comes in. So the research we did, and it's also shown in a very nice table in the book there, is actually we can see not only how drought tolerant, but also how much tolerant, which makes it possible to even make it easier to match tree for specific sites there. So that, that's uh, I'm, I'm very proud of uh, that we have done, because we can leave this um, guessing or just um, what we think and have seen and so on. And we now can move into more serious um, discussion. We can leave that. And it is sensitive. Move on. And where can people find your original research papers if they want to? That's sort of outside of the book. Yeah, sure. Uh, there is, um, if you look at ResearchGate, which is a community where researchers put the research uh, on. And if you go to ResearchGate, look for my name. All the papers is available there for download, most of them, which is open access. And uh, there you can find the, the publication there, and you can go into depth there. So that, that's the, as soon as we publish anything, it ends up there. So that, that's um, a good place to find the original uh, research of the stuff we are presenting in the book there. Yep. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Uh, I've just seen that there's been another comment in the chat about the chat, and I did see earlier on a couple of people saying the chat was a bit distracting and everything. Just as a sort of disclaimer, I, I know it annoys some people, I'm sorry, but we do feel that the chat is an important part of allowing people to communicate with each other and share ideas. I'm sorry if it's annoying to you. Um, and you can watch the recording later and it won't have the chat on there, but apologies for that if you if you didn't like it, but it is quite an important bit of what we're sort of doing. So. Um, okay, what have we got here that I was looking at? Um, 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 okay, so uh, Christopher's made a really good point about the fact that we've got to be careful that there's some trees that we're introducing and planting in the UK that at the moment are okay, but with a change in climate could become invasive and create problems in the future. Um, Chris has given, Christopher's given the example of Tree of Heaven. Um, is that something you allude to or cover in the book at all? Um, well, I'll, I'll start off and then let Henrik go. Um, in fairness, we don't start going down the sort of native, non-native uh, conversation. Um, the book, you know, we'd already was at twice the book, twice the page count, twice the price with what we had in there already. And, and it's, of course, it's another big debate. I think the the key thing, and obviously Henrik, you you pick up the answer as well, um, was about di is about diversity um, within the uh, the tree selection across uh, certainly the UK or, or different regions. Um, I think that that will no doubt people will be keeping an eye on that. Um, but again, this is hopefully about upskilling people's knowledge um, on on trees and. You know, the big push for me has been, you know, trying to get the book out and communicating about it. One of the things that I really want to be able to do, you know, with Henrik or other people are out there as well that are interested, is talking to the nurseries as well 
about availabilities, um, uh, you know, uh, of stock. Um, sometimes uh, things, I guess, are coming in that are just easy to to, to propagate now. But I mean, Henrik, what, what what's your take on that? Yeah, the thing is that, ooh, yeah, what 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 we do uh, in the botanic garden is that we actually asking around our colleagues, other botanic garden, we do our homework to read because if a plant, uh, a tree, that we want to use. Is that invasive otherwhere, elsewhere in the world in a climate that is today or in the future? Don't use that. So, if, so if you're scared of that, you can do the research to do reading, maybe or ask around, try to find where, for example, where is London today in London in in 75 years? So, where else in the world is a similar climate? And then you can ask around there to see if if there are an invasive, um, yeah, if that species start to become a, a weed or something, don't use it, and then you go to another species. So that, that, that's that's what we what we doing in uh, at the botanic garden because if it's invasive elsewhere in the climate that match the site of today and tomorrow, well, it's good chance that it will be invasive as well, but. If you look at Kew Garden, they have been growing plants, uh, trees there for hundreds of years. And there is a lot of species that have been growing there and haven't been weeding a lot in the garden or elsewhere. So trying to, understand, uh, trying to learn which are the invasive threats, stop using them. But there is a lot of other species that are safe to use. So what I would like to do, the next book we should do, or next chapter in the upcoming uh, book uh, when we do this uh, rewrite this one is to come up with a green list instead of this red list and black list to deal with um, the green list trees that have been growing for example in uk for a long time haven't become a weed fine use them Thank you very much. I love it when people already talk about revising the book they've just published or, or talk about the, the next book. It's always, so I'm sure I saw a look past Aaron's face there of I'm not doing this again for a while. <laughs> the thing not was, it's so funny because, in, like I said, the original uh, uh, content that we wanted, we were having case studies, we were going to do design elements, etc. cetera. But it, yeah, we, we realised that ultimately, pardon the pun, it was about getting everybody on the same page because we're not all on the same page. Even within our own industry, um, there are different... there are just there are just different ways that people are operating. I, I, I'm not you know throwing throwing mud at each other. You're either in the native non native camp. What camp are you in, and what do you believe? You know we haven't got we haven't really got the time for that. We need to kind of be pulling re, pulling on resource. If you know something, share it. Don't vilify somebody for not knowing something. If you know what I mean. And that's why this we we, we there was so much more that we wanted. To, to do um somebody saying that i just sort of flash up about the benefit of online publishing um again somebody asked us about putting this into why is it in an app and you know i know with tdag there's a bit there's more interaction you know obviously with the pdf etc but i think i mean again maybe i'm showing my age i think there's an element of too much google i want the answer I gave a talk the other day on the book and somebody said, um, after just giving a talk about the book with the book in my hand, and she said very innocently, have you got any crib notes that I can take away, Eric? Now, I kind of sort of didn't laugh at that, but that's this whole kind of need to just want to have things speedily in your back pocket. And it's great hearing people asking where they can get extra research going from. And I think that's what this book hopefully does. It will start opening up the box for people to go, you know, people that don't normally go into research papers and stuff and get excited. I kept falling down many rabbit holes. <laughs> that's why it took so bloody long to write. <laughs> People want instant gratification, Eric. That's the yeah. Problem. But like the tr- like the trees, they just want it in an instant, and it's like, well, it doesn't kind of quite come like that. I, I, I go back to this better. I mean, trees are 
obviously one of the best materials to teach us about having a great relationship with time out of all of the plant material out there you know you've got trees literally uh, sticking their fingers up at us that say do what you want i'm going to be here after you've gone so I, I think that if we we get that better time relationship going on um i think i think that will will, will really help as well and of course, if, if people are still looking for something for Christmas and they want to talk about time, they can think about Tree Time from Ted Green, available from One Good Bookshop. <laughs> Great segue, Ari. You can tell Ari's a professional. Fantastic. Okay. Um, right. So on the theme of, of doing a, a, updating the book or whatever, just a quick one, we've had a, one of our anonymous attendees. Uh, will there be a similar book for tropical and subtropical trees? Uh, not for me. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the stupid thing is I, I, I work travel around the world studying uh, trees in uh, temperate climate. So uh, when it comes to tropical, I'm, I'm very sorry. It won't be me. Sorry. But get, get whoever, the, whoever, whoever the anonymous person is, I'd say start writing letters to publishers of books. We want a tree on, trop book on tropical trees and request it that way. <laughs> <laughs> so Henrik's out. Eric, you got to do that one by yourself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've got to find another friend. Exactly, especially is he supports Chelsea, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Eric, you mentioned this earlier on, that the native, non-native thing, we've got a few people have asked questions about it, and it is a sort of perennial issue that we, we've kind of held our head in our hands as a sector for a long time. We've talked about it quite a lot in our webinars, that there's still that drive from certain areas saying we should plant native trees. Native trees are better. Native is the way forward. And certainly sort of our borer culture as a sector, I think our kind of established position now is we've got to diversify our tree stock. We can't rely simply on native trees. I was just wondering both of your perspectives, really. I mean, is this native, non-native thing something you still encounter in your work? And have you got any thoughts on it? Yeah, I mean, it definitely um, comes up. It comes up with, it backs into rewilding, it backs into, uh, you know, the book we've just done, Climate Resilience. We've had one, thankfully only one, uh, review that kind of was sort of slating what what does this all mean it's all jargon etc um and it kind of falls into that same camp of course i'm not an ecologist so i couldn't stand here and say the science behind it but i guess in my own experience and and the people that i've talked about and who i've what i've seen is that it would be impossible for things to stay as they are i think that there's that obviously the, the flora and fauna of this country, a lot of it that's been brought in anyway, so you kind of lose the fact of what you think is, so what we think is native anyway, it's just been here a long time as opposed to being truly native. Um, so I think that, that that gets mixed up. There's a lot of uh, emotion ca uh, caught up from, from people um, that would love to have this sort of lovely sort of native flora and fauna. We're just not in that same space. And certainly I take the view from scientists, I take the view from design, I take the view from, you know, uh, lot people that have got deep experience. I have to say, I probably err on the fact that the diversity is needed, um, for sure, um, uh, given our climate and our, and our uh, biodiversity uh, shift and change. That's where I'm coming from. I think you've got to get a rounded view. You can't just bang a gong and say, that's what it is. You need, you, you know, I'll always challenge anybody one way or the other. What's the other side of the argument? You can't just put it out and, and become, become outdated. It can become outdated quite quickly. Sorry, Emmerich. Yeah. The, the thing is, you, you need to be aware of where in the world you are, because there is regions in the world. I, I, I lived in China for one year in central China that, Native only, yeah, it could be possible in central China because in the region it's so species rich. So yeah, you have a lot of species to choose from, both from the dry sit, uh, situation for the wet and so on. But some other regions like UK and North uh, Western uh, Europe, like Sweden, we have such a poor and uh, native dendroflora. Uh, I did a study uh, a few years ago where we actually took all the the Swedish uh, native trees, which is like two less than you have, your Brits, but um, there's the same amount. And then we, we used this, all the, it was 30 species, and then we put all these 30 species through two filters. The first filter was 
who of this uh, 30 species will not face any serious threats of pests and diseases. And that's serious pests and diseases, like no no mildew on the leaves, it's like serious stuff, like the Dutch elm disease, the ash dieback, things that hits and kill trees that are fully healthy and uh, growing in the best environment. And based on that filter, out of 30, only 14 native tree species in Sweden passed that filter. And then the next filter was the remaining species, which of these will tolerate in the city environment of the climate of today, like, oh, that was five, six, six years ago. And then that filter put through only four species. So there was only four species that could pass these two filters. There was um, uh, sherry, like Prunerevium, there was Uniperus communis, which is a very small tree, and there was Sorbus intermedia, and there was Carpinus bachelor. There was four species. So if you want to create a sustainable green infrastructure and urban environment with native only, you have four species. It's not possible. And if you would like to add another filter for like climate change or a specific ecosystem service, you end up maybe with two species. So for some regions in the world, there is a non-question when it comes to urban environment to use only native. We have to include exotic as well or non-native. So, so for me, it's a non-question in some parts of the world. Other parts of the world, it's possible. I can see Atlanta. They have this uh, enormous species-rich region in the southern Appalachian. They can probably do it. But Gothenburg, no, it's not possible. So, so we need to have this discussion based on fact rather than emotional uh, feelings, like Aaron said. So that, that, that's where we are today. We, we need to actually base our debate on fact. So, yeah, that, that's my take on it, in a way. Thank you both. And, of course, one of the... One of the main reasons that people do say we should use native trees is for the biodiversity and habitat benefits. And there's one question here from Paula asking if the book covers the biodiversity attributes alongside the climate resilience, because that could help inform if we are introducing more uh, non-native species, as we should be, which ones are the ones we can pick to best replicate some of the benefits of those native trees? I, I would like to take that one directly, because maybe we should move away from the species selection and biodiversity instead talk about habitats. Because in the book, we talk about when you plan your project, if it's a housing area or it's just a private garden, please zoom out to see what kind of natural habitats or wildlife is it in your surrounding. And how can I, with my species composition and um, uh, design, add quality to the surrounding? Because a lot of research, both in Sheffield University, but also at Great Dixter, please have a look at the stuff Great Dixter have done. It's more about habitats and the connection with different li uh, living environments. It's more important than the species itself. So maybe we should talk about habitats, how we can create habitats for tree planting, creating multi-layer plantation, single dark leaf ones, uh, more um, uh, sun, yeah, sparse canopy and stuff like that, and how we can work with dead wood there, and we have a meadow connection with a shrubbery and a tree, that kind of networking uh, thinking, rather than just go into the rabbit hole of native versus exotic uh, when it comes to biodiversity. And uh, when it comes to non-native species and biodiversity, it's all about time. And I, I will just end up with a, a really nice study here in Sweden, because in Sweden we lost the elms due to the Dutch elm disease. We lost a lot of ash uh, trees due to the um, Dutch, uh, no, the um, ash, ash dieback. And a lot of insects, lava, mosses, m uh, fungi that were connected to elms and ash, they actually survive because... The sycamore maple, which is not native in Sweden, sycamore maple have been introduced, naturalized, and have been in the, the flora for a, such a long time. So the fungi, the insect, the, the, the larva and mosses, they could actually move into the sycamore maple. So actually it was a non-native species that saved a lot of 
uh, biodiversity that get lost through the Dutch elm disease and ash dieback, which means that we don't know which trees they're going to rescue the biodiversity because it's a question of time. Or I could talk about this forever, but yeah, it's interesting. Ari, did you have any thoughts on that one? Well, yeah, I mean, again, like I said, you know, it would be, I, I don't profess to be the, the, the expert on, on, on that. But I, I think that, you know, given the fact that at this moment, our, ch- our climate is changing with the trajectory that is um, carrying on getting warm. So even if everything stayed static and we didn't move any extra trees in or we didn't do anything, do we, and this is a, a sort of a question out, would all of our current um, uh, uh, biodiversity be able to cope anyway with the temperatures and the flooding and the, you know, of course we know that a lot of this has come from us, us lot, us humans uh, that have created it. But in terms of if it stays still and nobody moves and doesn't do anything different to the plant material, would the actual biodiversity actually be able to to survive anyway? And that would be a, a question. And there seems to be, uh, being able to, to, to bring it where, where there are examples of bringing in uh, better whole ecosystems, I guess, a bit like Henrik was touching on, it's, it's not just the tree, it's making sure you've got the ecotones, you've got the different sort of uh, 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 landscape areas that are knocking up to each other. So I think, I think that for me, the, the, one of the big things, which I'm learning a lot, I was at first set, set out thinking that I would probably want to just be working in um, private gardens, which is great. But three or four people maybe in that house get to benefit that by working hopefully in more public space, which I was always a bit like, oh, that's where all the grown-ups are. Um, you actually realise that you've got a bigger connectivity there to be able to sort of make a difference. And if you've then got the public coming to visit those areas, they can start to replicate and be more comfortable about doing it in their own gardens as well. So it's 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 not just that's the tree, that's the biodiversity piece and that's it link. I think it is wider than that. And that's what we're being challenged to look at as we urbanise, as the climate changes, all the impacts. It is it's more holistic than just 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 trees or just meadows. Mm-hmm. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, we got about we got about five minutes. So, a sort of a penultimate question. Uh, uh, this is a, a big opportunity for you to plug the book again here. I'm giving you because a couple of people have asked, uh, referred to the TDAG guide, which you both mentioned as well, which is a great guide that I know Henrik was involved in, and also Andy Hirons too, who's doing some great work. Um, and a few people have asked what this book sort of adds to the TDAG guide. Obviously, you can get the TDAG guide uh, online, and it's free, and it's a great resource. So. A couple of minutes to convince everybody why they need to get this book to supplement the knowledge they can already get from TDAG. Uh, first of all, a lot of research has been done since the TDAG was written. There's a lot of more uh, species, more um, knowledge. But what's not possible to uh, include in the TDAG is the, the explanation, which indirect gives the language that, uh, that we need to communicate when it comes to tree selection for yeah private and, and uh, public places there. So the, the book adds a lot of this explanation why it's drought tolerant. Because in the tea day it's like drought tolerant sensitive. But in this book it actually explains what makes it drought tolerant, what makes it sensitive, and also gives this language that me and Ari wants to communicate. So that that's the the big, big difference between these two um sources, so to say. Yeah. And, and I think for me, again, I, I, I know I bang on about sort of like wider reach. You know, TDAG come into my uh, remit, I don't know, five years ago or something. I'm not sure. I can't remember. But from a, from through sort of professional conversations. And this the book is, we, we gave ourselves a really hard target of trying to write a book that is heavyweight enough to be able to give professionals um, the infill of knowledge or some extra knowledge or some tweaks to what they know already, plus also make it um, accessible to uh, a 
the public. So, for example, when we say the public, it's not just people having like a, a single garden. I've got um, friends of my sister's work. So, where my sister works, she's got some of her colleagues, sorry, who, you know, they're lucky enough to have slightly larger land areas, for example. They want to put in woodlands, they want to put in um, uh, orchards, etc. And so, there are people that are sitting on quite big land mass that want to be able to plant trees. And, and therefore, they need a little bit of extra background. So I do think tea dag is great because um, I used it, and but I used it in that. Sl- I could. I, I find myself also trying to probably be a little bit more. Give me a tree for 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 drought. Bosh, sort the sort the key, take the tree, and not really probably connect in in the same way. So I think that really this is about having a bit more richness to your dialogue than just knowing a list of trees. It feels to me, it feels really almost unsexy if that's the right word now when when somebody says what's your favorite tree or they say give me a list of trees Eric, that i can plant in my garden because it feels it's beginning to me to feel lazy because i've sat there in in webinars writing down loads and lists and lists and then get home and actually when i've done a tiny bit of research realize that none of what was said <laughs> is relevant and needed and it just goes out your head again so I think that that's the difference of this book um, is, is like, as, as Henrik said, it is, is adding a bit more rich content um, to the, to the conversation. And also as well, it's a, um, it's not, it's not, a, it's not definitive in cell in the terms of you have to do this. It's to get us all thinking. It's to open up conversations like tonight. It's to add on to people's knowledge and it's to get people to go and start, um, enjoying the research of what's of what's coming through especially the new research right thank you very much okay look we've got a couple of minutes left so i'm going to ask i think i know the answer to this question from one of you but i'm going to ask our favorite question what is your favorite tree related book and let's see if at least one of you can not say your own book um. Well, I know that the publisher will be uh, watching this back and I will be saying that the go-to book is the Essential Tree Selection Guide. <laughs> um, but I, I genuinely, I, I, you know, it's nice that I actually believe in the book. I, it would be ridiculous of me not to say so. Um, and, and I will, you know, I, I will big up tea, the tea dag resource. I think it's great, but I just don't know that it's far-reaching enough. I'm, I'm interested in books that are far-reaching, um, you know, A Time for Trees, all of that type of thing but they they are more industry facing and yes i guess i'm a bit of a pivot because i like i'm I'm in the industry but i'm passionate about making sure the public get it because otherwise you just it's all on deaf ears Mm -hmm. absolutely well your publisher will be very pleased and it's a good answer so you're okay henrik what have you got uh i've thought about it for a long time and then i realized that there is one book that had made me into this geek person that goes all around the world and look at trees in, in the wild. And that actually Thomas Pakenham, I think, Remarkable Trees of the World, which is like, it's not much information, it's just beautiful pictures, amazing picture of trees in the wild, amazing trees and forests. And that book, just when I was a student, I, I bought it and then I start to uh, apply to so many different kind of sources to get money to travel to the west of US, the east of US, to Caucasus as a student, because I couldn't believe that there were existing habitats like that in the shown in the book. And that's the start of all the traveling for me. So so that that book here have been uh, very important or I don't know, that's when it went wrong completely. Thanks to that book, probably. Can I just answer something that I just literally just saw in the thanks, Henry? I just saw in the chat. Some I think somebody Gavin has said, "Is this more industry?" I presume he's talking about Albert. Is this more industry facing or more for the wider public? If I were having to really put the pivot on, the waiting was more is more um, industry facing, but with an excessive, as I said before, that is accessible if the wider public want to read it. Henry, is that fair? I mean, no, my head saying it can't be, it can't be dumbed down, and I, I, I don't think it is. Hemp, it was, you know. Yeah, but I think that the private person which had, with an interest uh, in trees and tree planting will get a lot of uh, from the book, definitely. Yeah. Hmm. 
Brilliant. Well, look, that was really, really great. And everyone seemed to have fun, which is good. So thank you uh, so much to Henrik and thank you, Arik. You're both brilliant. Really great presentations. Um, and all of you go out and buy the book, obviously. Go out there and do it because it's really great. And other books are available, like the one we've just started selling. And, and <laughs> you know, you can, other books are there, but why, why would you pick anything but this one? So thank you, Henrik. Thank you, Arik. Uh, thank you, Andrew, for helping behind the scenes. And to all of you for watching, thank you still, of course, for sponsoring our webinar series. See, I'm getting good at this now. I remember to do this. <laughs> Uh, please do join us next week for Clive Mayhew uh, looking at Woodlands at War and then we've got David Lonsdale at the beginning of next year like I said and then plenty more webinars to come so please do register for that but in the meantime have a good week and I look forward to seeing you soon Henrik and Eric once again thank you so much thank you for having me good night happiness thank you